I want to take you back in time exactly seven years ago, almost to the day, November 17th, 2008. It was a little colder than today, minus 20 degrees below zero. The visibility was dropping, the wind was picking up, the wind chills were dropping temperatures. It made it feel like minus 45, minus 50 degrees below zero. I was aiming towards two Nunateks, which are mountain peaks um, that, pe that kind of rise up out of the snow. And when I brought my compass up to level, I couldn't really make out those mountain peaks. And so I was, uh, I was just skiing forward blindly, um, not really knowing where I was going. I looked back to my other teammates just to make sure that they were safe. I put my poles out horizontally like this. It's a way that we communicate across great distances. And they mirrored my gesture, letting me know that they were safe and OK. Just the day before, we had landed uh, on the edge of the Antarctic continent. And looking at our shadows stretch across the uh, snow, one of my teammates was inclined to observe three small souls. And that's just exactly what we were, three small souls in that huge Antarctic space. On an expedition, there are hundreds of ways to fail. Falling in a crevasse, getting frostbite, running out of supplies. And at that point, more than anything else, all I wanted to do was turn around and go home. I call myself a polar explorer, and when most people meet me, they're generally pretty disappointed. <laughs> used to bother me a little bit, but now I'm used to it. And I think it's because I look a lot bigger and stronger in all of my polar gear. I don't always look this clean cut. Um, I did take a shower today. Um, my current no shower record stands at 72 days. So I don't know about you, you, but fashion tip for you, don't take a shower for about three weeks straight, and you can pretty much get your hair to do whatever you like. It's been hard to garner interest in my sport, which happens so far from even the edge of civilization, oftentimes at the breakneck speed of one or two miles an hour. So I've had to work very hard over the years to try to make what I do sexy. And it's not really easy. And so I've had to up my game a little bit <laughs> more recently, even taking up some extreme sports that I'm now currently the founding member of the Antarctic Polar Planking Association, currently ranked second overall. You guys a tough competitor. Mark Twain once said that God created conflict so that Americans can learn geography. And we now know about the layout of the city of Paris today, very sadly. We know about Gaza and the West Bank. We know about Syria because of these conflicts. But what I would like to offer you today is an opportunity to craft a global perspective not through negative things, but through exploration, and exploration of cold places. And I want to talk today about two of the most iconic cold places in the world, Antarctica and Wisconsin. <laughs> OK, I, I, I meant the Arctic. I always get those two mixed up. I will not be talking today about Mount Everest, which is another very iconic cold place which I have been to. Anybody here scared of heights? Um, do you want to see the cutest thing in the entire world? Do you think you can handle it? You said you could handle it, but you can't handle it, just so you're aware of that. Next time when you answer that question. Penguins live in Antarctica. Antarctica is a continent. All the snow and ice in Antarctica is ice on land. Antarctica is an amazing, vast, huge place it is the coldest place on our planet. It is the windiest place on our planet. It is the driest place on our planet. It is so extreme, in fact, that no human beings have ever lived there. On average, the Antarctic continent is covered by one half mile thick sheet of ice. When you are standing at the South Pole, you're standing at an elevation of over 9,000 feet. There's over two miles of ice at the South Pole, as I said. It's so extreme that no human beings have ever lived in Antarctica, 
which came as a little bit of a surprise to me when I was walking along one day. And I found uh, some evidence of an ancient civilization that I call Snowhenge. Skiing from the edge of the Antarctic continent to the geographic so uh, South Pole over a distance of 730 miles is many things, and one of which is very, very boring. Ice that is ice on land is an ice sheet. It's a very, very slow-moving glacier. And so we're able to almost ski in an unerring straight line all the way to the geographic South Pole. That is, unless we can't see anything, which it oftentimes is, because of conditions that are white out. You want to know what life is like on a big polar expedition in Antarctica? Here's what you do. You go home after this presentation. You sit in a bathtub full of ice water and you stare at a white sheet of paper for about 12 hours. Antarctica is a beautiful place. I just wish I could have seen it when I was there. <laughs> but it's an incredible experience to be traveling human-powered across these vast ice capes. You can understand a place by flying over it. You can understand a place by driving across it. But to be out there day after day, not for just a day, or a week, but nearly two months, and looking at an unending sea of white as it blends into the blue of the vault of the sky above us is an incredible experience and, uh, and a privilege that I do not take lightly. The Arctic Ocean, on the other hand, is ice on water. It is the polar opposite, both physically and philosophically, of Antarctica. It's a huge split, pay, split <laughs> it's a huge place. It's eight and a half million square miles huge. That's one and a half times larger than the size of Europe. And all year it's covered in this thin sheet of ice. And that ice is constantly moving depending on the winds, the tides, and the ocean currents. And there's enough mechanical action that you can form what's called a lead, which is a small crack in the ice. And it can be just a few feet across or upwards of a half mile across or even larger. And even in the coldest parts of winter, there is open water in the Arctic Ocean, and that's because of that mechanical action. The route to the geographic North Pole from the edge of land is anything but straightforward. That overall ice cap is moving, as I mentioned, because of winds, tides, and ocean currents, and it's actually pushing backwards when we leave from Canada. We would set up our tent at night and actually lose two miles while we slept. Just to get to that starting point is an adventure within itself, removing ourselves from civilization, the last leg flying in a small plane over northern Ellesmere Island, stopping to refuel at a major international airport along the way, and then landing at this place called Cape Discovery. There's no, there's no runway there. There's no film crew filming this. There's just us and one of the last great frozen wildernesses left on the planet, and cold temperatures minus 40 degrees, minus 50 degrees. In Antarctica, we're traveling in Antarctic summer. It's 24-hour daylight. Here in the Arctic, we're traveling just as the sun is coming above the horizon. So this rich light fills the sky and stretches our shadows across the snow and creates these unusual phenomenon of these cold regions. This is a sun dog where uh, a rainbow forms around the sun due to ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. At the beginning of this expedition, we're carrying everything that we need to live and survive for nearly two months with us. Our sleds weigh 325 pounds. They're so heavy that we can't pull them ourselves. And so we hook both of our, our, our harnesses up to one sled. We pull that forward, and we go back and get the next sled. And then we go forward again with the second sled. That means to cover every mile on the Arctic Ocean, we traverse three miles. But it's not like we can cover a mile or three miles at a time. That ice is so rough and the conditions are so bad that we maybe travel 200 yards at a time and then walk back into, at times, worsening conditions to get the, our, our second sled with us. We're skiing in the Arctic Ocean, but we're also, uh, we're also um, snowshoeing quite a bit. Antarctica, ice on land. That ice isn't moving very fast. The Arctic Ocean, a thin sheet of ice floating on water, constantly in flux. Sheets of ice called pans break apart, collide together, and so it creates this very dynamic surface, and we put snowshoes on to get traction and maneuverability in that rough surface. It's cold, very cold, and we're traveling in a very narrow margin of safety. And surprisingly enough, at 30 degrees below zero, I worry more about getting too cold than I do, or excuse me, I worry more about getting too warm 
than I do about getting too cold because we're working very hard. And if we wear too many clothes, we'll sweat and that sweat will freeze instantly. And so we're traveling in this very narrow margin of safety as we uh, progress northwards. To think about the end of the expedition on day one or day two is overwhelming. And so we break the big problem up into these manageable pieces. One of my philosophies on these expeditions is begin with one step. And so we take it one step at a time. It can be difficult, however, when you're dealing with constantly changing conditions to make a decision because we're forced all the time with two bad outcomes, two hours to cross a 200-yard section of ice. And so we have to remind ourselves constantly to be decisive, confident, and safe. But we rely on uh, other navigation techniques to help us when, with our decision-making process. We do use a GPS to check our position, but throughout the day, we use a compass to, to reference uh, the North Pole and hopefully make our way in as straight a line as possible. But it's not easy. The ice is moving, especially when you contrast it with Antarctica, which we can go in a straight line, and we're going up and down and around and over all these obstacles, a seemingly unending series of roadblocks along the way, or in this case, ice blocks, and then water. This is the Arctic Ocean. Those three or four feet of ice underneath that is 14,000 feet of cold, black, salty water. If we fall in unprotected, we have maybe five minutes tops to not turn into an ice cube. Hopefully we get lucky and we can skirt around the edge of some of these bigger leads till we can find a spot where it's narrower enough to cross, or maybe we find a slab of ice that we can use like a bridge. Or maybe we get a little more athletic, jump over some of these things, pull our sleds across afterwards. Or we take the Huck Finn approach to polar travel. We put our sleds together and build a raft and then raft across. Or swimming in a 14,000 foot deep icy ocean. It's a lot of fun and I will encourage you to try it sometime. But as I mentioned, whiteouts. And difficult in the Arctic Ocean for us to travel is we don't know if we're getting in any of these conditions where it might be flat ice or it might be this rough ice. So we're constantly dealing with this overlying sense of stress, especially when there are things there that want to eat you. I don't know about you, but I get really nervous when a polar bear stalks me and hides behind an ice chunk and comes up within 15 feet of me but I tend to get a little bit more nervous of these, which are all over the Arctic Ocean, ice sharks. I had a close encounter, I was able to swim away. You can believe it's okay. And then, incredible to be there. Not just for a day, not just for a week. There's nobody else here within hundreds if not thousands of miles and to have that perspective, you can't help but look at this place through a different lens and appreciate it for what it is, one of the last great frozen wildernesses left on the planet, and to see the scale and the physical dynamics of how this place works, the size of that ice, whether it's huge ice chunks as big as this whole room, or the small, small little hoarfrost crystals on the surface of a newly formed lead, or this. I mean, how does this even happen? Actually, I kind of know the physical properties of this, but incredible to see a snow, a, a, a paper-thin sheet of snow curl around like that and still find time to keep things sexy. <laughs> this was a particularly difficult journey because we were always running against a time deficit. Imagine the hardest thing that you've ever done in your entire life. Do that for 40 days. And now, double the effort that you have to go through. Double the amount of energy that you ex have to expend. Double the amount of time that you're traveling in the ice, going from eight hours or to, to, to nearly double that. And then half your sleep. And you see the position that we're in now, roughly 200 miles from the North Pole, with only 10 days of food and fuel left. We implemented a berserker strategy, and if we thought the conditions were difficult previously, now they're downright insane, and we had to go up and down and around and over um, 
at times even swimming through some of these obstacles till it, at a certain point we simply had no more energy left. We were 23 miles from the North Pole when all hell broke loose and it seemed like we would never make it. You gotta go. Hey, this is Eric calling in. Um, just wanted to give you a quick, quick update. We're 19.1 miles away from the pole, and things are really, really difficult. Um, there's water everywhere, there's leaves everywhere, there's broken ice everywhere, and the pans are small. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're just kind of get stuck in these areas that are like peninsulas surrounded by water, and having to put in the dry suits and swim quite a bit, and it's been snowing and it's sort of white out and so um, I fall I fall it fell through twice. It's just crazy. So we're gonna keep going. And see what happens. So. Thanks for following along. We still remain optimistic and are persevering towards our goal and are working well together. It was difficult, but eventually we would make it to the geographic North Pole, and I can only call the biggest moment of anticlimax that I've ever had in my entire life. There's no land, there's no marker, there's no nothing there. We fell asleep for about 36 hours, a plane picked us up, and I had two of the best cookies that I've ever eaten in my entire life. <laughs> but I had a chance to think about that trip as we flew back and what made us successful, and just the nature of these amazing, great, wildernesses that few people really know about or understand. The Arctic Ocean most likely will be ice free in the summertime by the year 2050. Antarctica has experienced on average three degree Celsius temperature rise in the last 15 years. Creating a global perspective is just like exploration. It's about learning new things and, and trying to accomplish very difficult feats. As explorers, you and I, we're no different. Our job as explorers in the 21st century is not to go out and protect, uh, conquer these places, but it's more to protect them. And that's the message that I'd like to leave with you today. Thank you. <laughs>